The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Hey, Kara Ustros here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Wheat School episode, and I have here with me Haley Catton, who is a research scientist in field crop entomologist with Agriculture Niagara Food Canada. How's it going today? Hello. Hi, Kara. Nice to be here. Absolutely. So uh, we're here today to talk about wireworms. We're starting to see them out in the fields. Uh, they're starting, I know you've done some research surrounding them. Um, if we're looking for wireworms in the field, what sorts of things are we going to be looking for? Right. So if you're doing scouting, um, once your crop is in the ground, so post-emergent scouting, then you're going to be looking for thinned areas um, of your field. So maybe areas where the um, seedlings never came up in the first place, or they did come up and they're starting to yellow at the center of the plant. If you see that, there could be a couple of different reasons, um, you know, um, why your crop is thinned in that area, like, for example, a frost patch. So if you want to know if it's wireworms, you have to go to that patch, go to those sick looking plants uh, and dig them up and see if you find the wireworms in the act of eating your plant's roots. So um, what, sort, what sorts of damage can they actually do long term if they're eating the roots, you know, that could really have a yield impact? Yeah, well, early in the season, their feeding is the most impactful on the crop, right? Because they're actually killing young plants. So they're preventing your crop from emerging from the ground. So that definitely has yield impacts and other agronomic impacts, such as opening space up for weeds to grow. So the wireworms do continue feeding as the plants grow, but once the plants are big enough, they can withstand the feeding, right? But it's when they're at the seed and seedling stage where they're very vulnerable to just getting outright killed from wireworm feeding. And what do the wireworms actually look like if you're looking to see them in the field? Right. Um, they are... They're not actually worms. They're the larval stage of a beetle called the click beetle. There's multiple species of them, but in general, you're looking for uh, a long bodied, yellow, kind of hard shelled, worm like creature. <laughs> and uh, we have some really nice photos of them. Uh, there are other things out there that people mistake for wireworms. Sometimes people mistake a cutworm for a wireworm, or uh, some beneficial insects can look like wireworms. So it is important to know. Um, what you're looking for. And speaking of beneficial insects, are there any beneficials that attack the wireworm? Yeah, that is very difficult to study. We think there are. You know, we just got a report from agronomist, an agronomist in Saskatchewan this past week saying they were digging around looking for wireworms, found them, but also found this other little insect that we think is the larval stage of a beneficial ground beetle that were there feeding on the wireworms underground. So, we, we think there are beneficials that eat them, but it's very difficult to know because the soil is just so hard to see through, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. What, what, what's out there for thresholds right now when we're looking, you know, economic and action thresholds? Right. We wish there was a threshold. Uh, right now, the, the most effective control is chemical seed treatment, which you have to decide, obviously, before you seed. So at this stage of the year, it's, it's a good time to be looking at the fields and seeing if there are thinned patches so that you can make a decision for next year. Now, we don't have a threshold at this point. It's just, you know, as a farmer or an agronomist, is there enough damage to warrant the investment in a chemical seed treatment? And right now, that's just a judgment call. We are hoping to get some advancement on this issue and, and develop um, a threshold. And that research is underway right now with using drone imagery to try to detect those thin patches from above, and then which would guide our insect sampling itself. Uh, but we now, don't have that ready yet. That's just starting this year. Oh, okay. And that's, is that conducted in mm -hmm. Lethbridge as well? Uh, yeah, within a 90 minute drive of Lethbridge. So we're using commercial farm fields for that study. Awesome. And uh, if you're looking at mm -hmm. the larvae of the uh, wireworm, does it overwinter? Like when, when, are, when are they hatched or when, when does that click beetle actually hatch their egg? Right. Great question. So we're, with wireworms, we're talking multi-year life cycles. So if you see a big, nice big wireworm in your field, it's probably three or four years old. So <laughs> the, they're only adults for above ground in the spring just for one season of their life, just a few weeks, they're adults, right? Those adults will lay eggs uh, around now, actually. 
those eggs will hatch in the summer and then they'll grow into little wireworms. And those little wireworms will live in the soil for multiple years and keep eating and feeding and growing until one summer they're big enough, they start or they enter the pupation or the metamorphosis period um, where they'll turn into an adult under the soil in the summer. And then they stay there in a little chamber all winter and then they emerge that next spring. So when you're asking, do they overwinter? They overwinter as larvae, right, for multiple years. And then in their final year, they'll overwinter as an adult in the soil. So what sort of conditions do they thrive in? Like if we're seeing, do they do the like the drier, the cooler, or what, what sorts of things are they looking for? Yeah, uh, well, we see more damage when there's dry, like dry areas of the field, like say a hilltop of the field. But I don't know if there's more wireworms there or the, just the plants are more vulnerable at the top of a hill because they're more water stressed. Uh, so you'll see more damage in certain areas, but we don't know how the wireworms are distributed in a field. And we're hoping to learn more with our overhead imagery study on that. So really it's, it's about walking the fields and seeing there's, there's, oh, there's a patch there. What is that patch? Uh, digging around, seeing if you find the wireworms. Now is the perfect time to do it when, when the plants are, you know, just young seedlings. And the bonus for doing it now is that, um, you can also detect cutworms through scouting right now. And you definitely want to know if you have a wireworm problem or a cutworm problem or both uh, because there are different treatments for the different types of insects. So cutworms are moths and there are in season rescue chemical treatments available for cutworms, but not for wireworms. So you definitely want to know what insect is causing those damage patches in your field because uh, that can direct what kind of treatment you're going to need. Okay, absolutely. And is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, we have a field guide coming out in just a few months on wireworms on the prairies, uh, co-authored by myself and several colleagues. And we will have all the information you could ever want to know on prairie wireworms, including high resolution photos, how to identify them, um, other insects that can be mistaken for them, management options, monitoring options, um, just the complete package on prairie wireworm um, information. So we're expecting that. Uh, June or July this summer. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing it and hopefully getting some information out of that as well. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thank you very much, Haley. Thanks, Kara.